And we're really pleased that we'll have a guest lecture now from, from New Story. And uh, we've just introduced kind of the opportunities for industrialized construction. I think this is a great example of a company that uh, has dedicated itself towards thinking about innovation and construction and actually realized and executed um, on that vision and have implemented uh, 3D printing for a community along with some other uh, really big ideas for industrialized construction to end homelessness. So um, uh, with that, we have uh, uh, Julieta Moradai, if I said it right. Yes, you <laughs> did perfectly. Thank you. All right. And um, she is the director of research with New Story, if I have that right also. I'm and the head of research and development now at New Story, yes. Head of research and development. And uh, I will let her take it away from there. So welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. Perfect. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I also just sent you the email with the two links, so just let me know if that's working for you. Perfect. Perfect. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. As Daniel mentioned, I'm the head of research and development at New Story. Um, just a few years ago, I was sitting in your seat. I was a master's student in structural engineering and in architecture at UC Berkeley. And I worked for two years at Arup as a consultant in structural engineering. So I was doing the whole corporate thing. And uh, while I was there, I was actually volunteering for New Story. Since they were just kicking off and very early days into using a 3D printer, to build homes. And so I was very excited about what they were doing. And I started working on their board of advisors and then ended up loving it completely. So jump ship and now working full time. So really what my role is, is I partner with uh, top academics or industry partners to bring their big innovations into developing countries. And how can we use top innovations in architecture, engineering, construction, but use them for the context of building homes in developing countries. And so throughout this presentation, what I'll be talking about mainly is what is global homelessness and what are we actually doing to address it? I wanted to introduce new story and more specifically focus on what we're doing in industrialized construction, which I know is your focus for this class, and then dive more deep into 3D printing, which I'm sure you're all excited to hear more about. And then at the end, we'll have some Q&A. So if you have any questions, just please write them down and we'll do some Q&A at the end. So just to kick off, I do have a video that Daniel is going to pull up, um, which kind of highlights the history of New Story and who we are. And really just from the get go, the main thing that you should know is that New Story, our mission is to end global homelessness by being the R&D branch of affordable housing. So this is actually very uncommon within affordable housing organizations. And our main focus area is how can we be that R&D branch, not just for New Story, but really to share our innovations with other housing organizations. So Daniel, do you mind um, pressing the video for slide number two? Okay, I'm gonna put you back on the main screen. Perfect, let me know when it's back on. Okay, you're back up. Great, thank you. So I, I love that video because it really shares the history of New Story and really how early on we are. We just started five years ago. So as the video mentioned, uh, we started five years ago through Y Combinator, which is the biggest incubator here in Silicon Valley. So typically it's companies like Airbnb, Uber, um, those kinds of companies that go through Y Combinator. So being the very first nonprofit to go through such a tech oriented incubator, what that's really allowed us to do is set the precedence for what it means to do R&D as a focus for affordable housing. And the main reason that we're even trying to tackle this issue is that the main driving factor, the main issue is that there's 1.6 billion people in the world that don't have access to adequate shelter right now. So that's 20% of the global population. And that number is just rising, skyrocketing. So by 2050, it's going to be 3 billion people. There's this huge housing crisis and a gap that's getting larger and larger. And we just need to figure out more innovative ways to construct and to build if we're ever going to address this issue, just because of the mass critical issue right now. And so at New Story, we're trying to address this by not accepting the status quo. And by status quo, what I mean is if we look at the construction industry, we've been building the same for dozens and even hundreds of years if we're looking at the fundamentals of how we build. So we just know that we cannot stick with a status quo. We need to figure out more innovative ways of building. And that's how we started focusing on industrialized construction and then other more innovative ways of design as well. So really our focus on, on how we're tackling this 1.6 billion number that's increasing to 3 billion is we're looking at emerging technologies first for the context of using them in developing countries for affordable housing. 
So typically when a new innovation comes out like 3D printing, you would think that the first application is for some bougie hotel in San Francisco, but we're saying, why don't we rethink that and actually apply these emerging technologies first for the use case of need, for the use case of impact. And so just to give you some context first on news story, like I mentioned, we are a housing nonprofit building communities internationally. So our main vision to tackle this massive issue of the amount of people without adequate shelter is that we believe nobody should be living in survival mode. And what I mean by survival mode is living day by day, just trying to figure out where you're gonna get your food, your water and your shelter. So we have seen numerous examples of when people do not have shelter, when they don't have a roof over their heads or they don't have solid ground or a place to sleep, they're spending many, many hours just trying to find their basic needs and not their hours into being able to find a job or build a community. And so we, by, we believe by focusing on housing, it's a primary need that actually impacts the economy, health, many other factors that trickle down. And that's why we have decided to focus on housing as our number one goal. So to give you an impact of how we've actually focused on housing in the past five years, so since we first started, we've built communities in four different countries. So we built communities in Bolivia, that's where we started, in Haiti, where we still have active construction sites right now, in El Salvador, and in Mexico. Mexico is actually where we are focusing on the most now, just because of our relationships with governments, and that's actually where our 3D printed site is. And so this is just an example of the kind of impact we've had in terms of building. And really our mission behind what we've done in the past five years is we want to pioneer solutions to end global homelessness. So really up until probably two years ago, our main focus was to build. It was to build communities. And within every single community that we built, we wanted to find a new innovative way to do it. So we were able to figure out what are the main issues in, in housing? How are people currently building? How are major organizations and NGOs building homes? And what are the critical issues that's stopping them from building more quickly or at a higher quality? And that's when we started focusing on how can we look at R&D? How can we start looking at more innovative solutions to build, to look at those issues that we're seeing other organizations are facing, we're facing, so that we could build smarter and then share those innovations with others. So about two years ago, that's when we started to really focus on R&D. That's where actually 3D printing came from, when we started to look at way more innovative ways of building. And that's where our driving mission came from. So our driving mission to pioneer solutions to end global homelessness. And by pioneer, what we mean by that is that we're looking at not the status quo, but we're looking at what is things that are beyond what's been done before. How can we be leaders in this R&D space for affordable housing? So that's our goal. It's really to be this R&D branch of affordable housing and not just do it ourselves, but to partner with other NGOs, nonprofits, and governments so that then we could share our innovations with them and have major impact on the sector. So we saw a major opportunity here because we saw others were not focusing on R&D. No other nonprofit had this high, high focus on an R&D team and really investing a lot into um, these kinds of projects. Because if we look at organizations within governments, they don't necessarily have the profit to, or, or margins really to be focusing on R&D, nor do they have the time. They have critical issues they have to solve tomorrow. If we look at the for-profit sector, their main mission is not to be focusing on this kind of impact work. And then if we look at uh, nonprofits, they just don't have the budget necessarily to be focusing on R&D. So that's when we started seeing this opportunity to close that gap and be different. So the way that we focus on R&D is through a strategy that we call create, prove, and share. And so by create, what I mean is first we create breakthrough solutions for ending homelessness. So every single community that we have built over the past five years, we started looking at what are the critical issues within design and building? What are these maybe minor or major issues that are stopping us from building quicker and better? And so by building and actually being very heavily involved in the process of working with local partners and governments and seeing how they typically build communities, we're able to identify the major issues and then create breakthroughs, which I'll cover more later in the presentation, what kinds of breakthroughs we've created. By prove, what I mean is by actually implementing innovations in every community that we build. So in the four countries that I showed you, every single community has some type of innovation that we've implemented. What we're able to do is actually prove the technologies. So many times when you're doing a new innovation, especially within construction industries, in the US, for example, or in Switzerland, it is incredibly different, difficult to bring in a new innovation because of building permitting. 
it's very conservative. So it's very hard to actually hit the ground running and very quickly iterate within the construction industry. But by working in developing countries, we have lower barriers of entry of actually implementing technologies, rapidly prototyping and then proving that they work. And so what we have done is we've created a data impact program. We've created a program where we actually survey everything that we do, what, where it's actually the families to hear feedback from them, but also survey how are these technologies working? Are they reducing cost? Are they reducing time? And actually measuring what is the success of using this technology so that when we're proving it, we're, out, we're able to share those successes with others. So that brings me to my last point, which is that we share solutions. Our big impact mission here is that we're not just creating solutions that are gonna make us better, but really the whole industry better in terms of being able to share which innovations are working, which innovations are not working, equally share our failures, so then others could implement them in their organizations and in their projects. So what I was explaining by the past five years is that we've really focused on building. So by building, what we're able to see is the major challenges within the building industry. And like I said, every single community that we actually built, what we did for the next one is that we're trying to mitigate those challenges by innovating. So all of our R&D projects are trying to focus on three major buckets of innovation. One, it's to reduce cost. So in any major housing issue, the major, major issue is cost. There's too much demand and not enough supply because the cost of every single housing unit is so expensive. And in developing countries, the most expensive cost is material and not labor. So in Switzerland or in the US, labor is actually the most expensive cost component. But in developing countries, it's, it's the material, the construction materials. And so how can we start reducing either through structural optimization, the actual structural components, or how can we reduce the cost of material by being more efficient in the way that we're thinking of construction? The second bucket is speed. So how can we reduce the overall speed of construction? That's where 3D printing technologies or other industrialized construction technologies come into play. And the third is quality. So this is a major issue in developing countries that the quality of material and the quality of labor is not sufficient for resiliency and for sustainability. So how can we focus on actually being more innovative in terms of the quality of design and in construction and then inspections? So like I mentioned, by building, we're able to see the major challenges and by focusing on R&D, we're able to innovate. And it's an iterative loop because every single time we implement a new innovation in a community, what we're able to see is what are challenges within that innovation itself and the next time we go to a different community, we're able to be iterative and figure out how to actually make this innovation better. So I'm not gonna cover this in too much, but just for, for some of you that have questions in terms of our operations end-to-end -end process, what I mean by building is we're working with local partners, so local contractors and designers, engineers, and local governments to build communities. So we know we're never gonna be experts of the region, so we really heavily focus of collaborating with our local partners to go from the vetting process of acquiring land all the way through pre-construction of designing with community members and local partners to construction with local labor to then post-construction of coming back years later and actually surveying the communities to see what works and what doesn't. So by focusing on these challenges and being innovative, what we've been able to do is create a housing innovation toolkit. So this comes into play with our share model. What we wanna do is every time we have an innovation, we wanna be able to share with other organizations. So what we're developing is essentially a library of innovations, which we call this housing innovation toolkit. And our innovations fall within three major buckets, software, hardware, and design processes. So to kick off with software, like I mentioned, the very first thing we always do is we look at what's a major challenge within building to then innovate. So for software, we saw very early days of actually building communities is that nobody is asking the end user what their needs are. And the way that we're actually capturing information from the end users was incredibly inefficient. So what we were seeing from major housing organizations and governments is that they were surveying their population of people living in inadequate housing, people living in extreme poverty through paper surveys. So this was a common trend amongst every country we worked in. They were sending out hundreds of people and using hundreds of hours to go and do paper surveys of who's in need, what their critical needs are. Then this information was lost or was not organized properly. There was no major central database that was actually calculating how many people are in need and per what year. So what we said is, let's think of a very innovative solution, but that's incredibly simple, which is why don't we just use an, an app, a technology that works offline 
where we could gather data very quickly on one place and then when we're online, it's centralized into one place. So that's what we did. And really we did this to help us with our time. So we developed, we have a technology team in Atlanta, our headquarters in San Francisco, but we have another team in Atlanta, Georgia. And we developed an offline app which essentially asks all the same questions a survey does, a paper survey does, but now you need way less resources, less people, less time, and it's all organized and synced into one location. What I love about this example is that when we talk about innovation, it's not something that necessarily has to be this fancy you know, 3D printer. It could be as simple as creating an app which works you know, offline, which is not you know, too difficult to do. But if we're thinking about it in the context, you know, in the US when we develop it here, this is something that's very easy and common, but actually being able to tweak it for the context of what we work in in developing countries is a major impact. I mean, we're able to save roughly 75% of time and resources just by using this survey app, and it has effects for many years to come because we're able to measure our impact. And in terms of being able to share this product, we launched it roughly one year ago, and now over 25 organizations worldwide in four different continents are using this app because they've realized the benefits of using it. In El Salvador, we started using it in a few of our communities. And then the full cabinet in El Salvador, so the Ministry of Housing is now gonna use it for all of their projects over the next five years. So that's just an example of how we are creating innovations for ourselves, for our challenges, but then it has a major impact the second that we start sharing it. The next bucket is hardware. So this is probably the one that you're most excited about and I could answer more questions about uh, in, during our Q&A. But for hardware, we pursued 3D printing. And the main reason we did this is because we saw some major issues with quality assurance and quality control. So speed was one of the major buckets, of course, but really for QA, QC, the issue that we were seeing was that in developing countries, the quality of the material mixture for concrete is not necessarily good enough for the seismic conditions we were working in. So how can we start actually implementing the quality that we want in our material and in our labor to make sure that these families are living in safe and resilient homes during any kind of natural disaster? So we realized that through uh, using robotics, we're able to more precisely control the material mixture and the actual application of the material to make sure that we are applying it properly. And then of course, this falls within the bucket of speed because we're able to build homes much quicker so we could close the housing gap quicker and cost. We're actually not wasting any material when using a 3D printer because all materials used for the printing process. And so this is also a sustainable factor. Then I have a video of our 3D printed community, which I'm actually not gonna share, Daniel, because um, you could share it after the Q&A if you'd like to, to be good on time. Sure, no problem. Perfect. Um, but just to cover very quickly, we could do this more during Q&A, but to cover really quickly why I, I like to share this example precisely is because this is an innovation that has not been scaled yet. We were the very first to permit with US building codes, a 3D printed house. So what I love about this innovation in particular is we're saying the very first adopters of this super high-end technology is for the purpose of impact and for the purpose of working in developing countries for housing. And also the idea that we could take an innovation that has not been scaled or even proven because it hasn't been permitted yet, we were able to in two years permit this in Austin, Texas, do two prototypes there, then bring the innovation to Mexico and we're currently building a full community. So that video that I was gonna show is showcasing our actual, uh, was our press launch back in December, and when we first shared with the world the community that we're building. And ICON, our partner, our R&D partner that's pursuing this technology, they are doing a full community that they just uh, showed in the Washington Post last week in the US. So this would have never happened unless an organization like ourselves was able to prove the technology in Mexico where there's lower barriers of, of entry where we're able to convince the government to build a full community of these homes and prove the technology, prove how it prints quicker, the high quality of it in a seismic condition, and that because it's US building permitted, it was very easy to then adopt in the US after once we were able to convince people that this works. So we're starting to see very quickly how we could start changing the mindset of such a traditional industry. The architecture, engineering, construction industry is incredibly conservative, but the second you're able to prove it through real full scale models and we're building a full community and we're showing scale, we're showing applicability and the reliability of it. That's how you're able to really convince people and move the needle. So we're excited because in the past two years we've been able to permit this technology, scale it in Mexico and now it's being adopted in the US, which again, I do not believe it would have been able to do if we did not prove the technology first. 
So in terms of our third bucket, design processes, uh, we have adopted um, an innovation. Like I said, it's something that's very simple, but using it in the right context can have a big impact, which we call lean participatory design. So really what it is, it's a form of um, human-centered design, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, where the main philosophy behind it is you're asking your end user what they want when you're designing a product or a design space. So again, the main, main innovations that come up are always through looking at challenges first. And a main challenge that we saw in Mexico was that roughly 15% of affordable housing units that the government is paying for and building every year are vacant. So 15% of these new buildings for affordable housing are not being utilized. So we were wondering, why is this happening? Why are we spending so much money into building you know, homes and you know, for people who are in need, they're in critical need, they're living on the streets, but they're not occupying these homes. And what we realized is that this answer is way too simple. It's that these homes were not properly designed for the end user. So they were building these housing units way too far from current transport, services, jobs, and they were not culturally appropriate. They were building, for example, kitchens indoors, whereas these families would never be cooking indoors because of the major heat conditions. And other examples of safety where they were just not building these units properly for the context of the families living there. So what we decided to do is come up with a process where the actual family members are the architects where we involve them in the design process from very conceptual design, schematic design, all the way through construction documentation so that families can be involved in the actual design of their home and in the design of their community so that we're making sure that every single community is designed for the end user. And what we realize is that they feel ownership of these homes and that these homes are a lot more sustainable because they actually want to grow their community there and live there for many generations to come. So the process is pretty simple. What we do is we have a series of workshops through uh, schematic design all the way through construction documentation where we split up teams between age and gender. And what we've seen is that by doing that, by splitting up age and gender, people feel like they have a voice and they speak up. They speak up about their main concerns, their main needs. And this is a great example of you know, little girls that are actually designing their homes. And it's incredible when you split up these uh, gender and age how they start speaking up about their particular needs. For example, children will say that they want a courtyard between homes because they feel more safe playing outdoors if the homes are in a courtyard shape. Um, adults will say completely different things, but we try to incorporate everyone's feedback in terms of the home design, but then also the community layout. In terms of an innovation that we've adopted since then, so when we come up with an innovation, like I said, we're very iterative. We continue trying to make it better and adopting new innovations. We've actually partnered with Unity, which is a gaming platform. Um, and they have developed a new plugin that allows you to go from 3D modeling in Revit directly into Unity Reflect. So you're able to take your 3D model and directly input it into virtual reality um, headset. And so this is an example that we see way too often within our industry, which is that when you're working with architects, engineers, contractors, and you're in so many different disciplines, everyone has their own technical language. And it's incredibly difficult to actually communicate and collaborate all in the same um, field. And so we saw some major challenges in terms of when you're working with 2D plan views, it's incredibly difficult to express scale and express what you're trying to design. So what if we actually immerse someone in 3D in an immersive environment where they could walk through and understand the scale and really what we're trying to design or give us proper feedback. And so we decided to do this with our most complicated design, which is our 3D printed homes. I mean, how can you convince families that these homes are gonna be reliable? Trying to explain to them what the material texture is gonna look like of the walls. Trying to explain to them how these curved walls are gonna look and how the 3D printer application works. So not just working with families, but also working with local contractors and governments. So we saw some um, major benefits of using this, of going from our 2D lean participatory design, which everything was in 2D plan views, to actually working in virtual reality, where we're able to do this incredibly quickly because of this new plugin. And one, it's to be able to convince local officials, local government more quickly because they're able to understand the technology. Two, it's to bring it on site to actually showcase to the contractors how the technology is gonna work so that they are you know, quicker at adoption. And three, and most importantly, it's to actually communicate to the families. So before they move in, being able to showcase to them in real scale, they could walk through the homes in this virtual environment. So really everything that we've talked about, all the R&D solutions that we're doing, we have many more in the pipeline, are all thanks to our R&D partners. 
So New Story is not developing these from scratch, but really what my role is, is to look at what are the main players in academia and main players in industry doing that's innovative? And where can we start applying these technologies for the context that we work in in developing countries for housing? So this idea that these innovative solutions can be adopted first for the context of impact and what that means. So I'm not gonna go through this full list, but we are collaborating with a lot of universities and a lot of industry partners to take these technologies into practice, prove them through being able to scale them in an area with lower barrier, and then share them with other organizations, other housing governments, like I mentioned in El Salvador, now they're using our tech tool for all of their housing projects and many other NGOs and nonprofits so that they could also have impact. Another way of collaborating with New Story um, as not an R&D partner, but as a student or as a young professional is we have an R&D fellowship now where you could actually participate in helping us grow not just our library of innovations, but really our, our database of understanding of affordable housing and where we are currently in our industry. So we're creating an essentially an encyclopedia of affordable housing. And we have a fellowship where every single fellow is allocated a very specific topic in a different category. And we have a cohort of fellows that share essentially their thesis and their learnings as we're building this encyclopedia because we think it's incredibly important to have a benchmark of all the biggest innovations in affordable housing that's living in one place so that as we're growing our technologies and as we're growing our partnerships with other governments, we could tell them where in their current region are the biggest technologies and biggest opportunities. So if you're interested in this opportunity, um, please feel free to email me. And I've also included here a link to our fellowship. Um, and I've included on the last slide my email if anyone would like to ask me any questions. So I'm going to open up the floor now to any Q&A that you have. I know you might have questions about our 3D printer. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for the, the great presentation. And um, I will add my own personal uh, uh, opinion that uh, this is a really interesting uh, fellowship opportunity. So if you have any interest, you can also ask me about it. Um, uh, if you want to just chat shortly with me about it or how we could even include it as part of potential master project or master theses um, uh, for credits as well. Uh, but with that, um, let's open up to the floor for any questions. and. Uh, I think you can see everyone, right, Julieta? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So. Yeah. Uh, I had a question. So first of all, I have to say I find really interesting and really great the problems that you're trying to solve or that you have partially already solved. But the question that I have is how did you overcome the land pricing issues? Or how are you facing them? So that's a great question. Your question is about land prices and just acquiring land in general, I'm sure. So like I mentioned, we work with local partners and local governments. And so we do not believe that we could just come in and say, we're going to be solving this big issue. We're going to come and acquire land and build. We actually focus on partnering with local, part with local partners, so local contractors and designers, but really our main focus before we even pick a location is partnering with the right governments. So within the municipality, state and federal level, we are partnering with local governments because by doing that, it's a more sustainable model since they're actually in charge of who needs housing and where, where is it most critical, who's most vulnerable, but also they're providing land and they're providing utilities. And so by working with local governments, they're telling us where to build. They're giving us the plots of land that are free. So infill land or open land, greenfield construction. Where is that land closest to current services and jobs and city centers and giving us utilities? So if we were to just come in and buy land like other organizations might do, we don't necessarily have access to things like utilities. And our main focus is housing. It's not necessarily getting the right uh, utilities there. So we wanna make sure we're using you know, locally sourced things but also local um, services and utilities. And so in terms of acquiring land, we work directly with the government but a big focus that we have in terms of ownership for families is making sure the families own the land. So making sure every single parcel of land, the government is giving to the family and not necessarily doing anything where the government still owns the land and we're just building on it because we don't think that's a sustainable model. So um, to answer your question, we don't buy the land, we get it acquired from the government, but then we make sure that the families are able to do some kind of process of paying off um, through a mortgage or through subsidized mortgage, uh, this land property. Sorry. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting lecture, and it's quite impressive for us to come from a 
know, this idea, how it's all becoming a reality now. And what I'm thinking is all of what we've seen is like low rise and not that dense. And, you know, like you're saying, you're looking to end global homelessness. And I don't think that works uh, for, you know, uh, cities, let's say. And I'm wondering if you're also thinking how to implement, you know, all your uh, approaches. And if you're thinking about, you know, multiple story or what, yeah, what your plans are in that respect. Like, thanks well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because it's actually something that we're developing right now, a strategy for our next five years. So like I mentioned, the first five years, what we really focused on was building communities and trying to figure out what are the major issues in housing organizations. And so, I mean, we're very, very early on. We're, you know, just five years in in terms of what we're doing. But that's a very good question because, you know, the majority of the population, 75% of the population will be living in urban areas, in cities. And currently, our main focus has been greenfield construction, low-rise, one-story, two-story homes. And that's not going to solve the issue of density. And that's not going to solve the issue of 3 billion people in 2050 are going to be living, you know, that, that are in adequate shelter. 75% of those people will be living in cities. So we need to start thinking about retrofitting, about infill lines, about slums. And so what we realize is in the past five years, we've become really good at building in greenfield construction, at being innovative and building one-story, two-story homes, but we want incremental learning. We want to figure out where can we have a major impact outside of just rural areas. So what we've decided to do, actually, is figure out a strategy where we could focus in one location, so one city in the next five years, and look at not just rural areas, but really in, within a city, where can we have impact? So where can we find innovations to look at density, to look at retrofitting existing buildings that are vacant, or retrofitting um, property that maybe has been, you know, after an earthquake has, is no longer utilized, or looking at infill, looking at slums, revitalizing a city essentially. So our major focus now over the next five years is gonna be to pick one city and to start looking at innovations outside of just rural areas, but really focus on density. And think of to have a major impact on ending <coughs> global homelessness, where is the major area where we could have the biggest impact? So over the next five years, that's what we're going to be trying to answer. And that's actually why we've started developing this research fellowship. It's because we need to have incremental learning. And what we realize is there's not one place, one encyclopedia for affordable housing, one place where we have all the information of what's been innovative within every single category of construction for affordable housing. So not just one story, two story structures where you could 3D print something on a greenfield construction, but really where can we be innovative for high rises? Is this now gonna be prefab, modular? Is it something else? We, we wanna look at what are all the innovations that we currently have accessible to us today and where are there gaps of innovation that we should be focusing on for the next five years? Does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture. Um, I was very very impressed about the footprinting of the concrete, but I was wondering if there was some enforcement in it or is it liable to be forced? Because I didn't see something in the short video initially. Daniel, do you mind repeating the question? She was cutting out a little bit. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, for the 3D printing, uh, it's a question of reinforcement. Um, do you have some kind of fiber reinforcement? Uh, because we don't see the, the actual structural reinforcement in the, in the video. That's a great question, and I love answering this to structural engineers, because um, I get this all the time. So let me just actually flip back to, I'm not sure if you could see it here. Um, maybe you could see a cross section right there, okay. So, there is, it's all uh, reinforced concrete. So let me just go back to this video. Can you see that? Yes, but Perfect. it's not moving. Oh, wait. Uh, I was going to show a cross section of the wall. So it's regular reinforced concrete structure. So there's everything that you would have as a design for reinforced concrete. And the way that it works is I was trying to show a cross section of the wall, actually. So you could see it over here. The wall essentially is two layers, um, inner and outer wall, and then in between there's some kind of lattice structure that's it's triangular. So within the lattice structure, there's these voids along the full length of the wall. So within the length of the wall, there's, there's vertical rebar, and then within the horizontal plane, there's mesh rebar. 
And so just like any re regular reinforced concrete wall, you have the exact same amount of rebar as you would have. And that really was for US building permitting. We wanted to try to use the most simple method of, of showcasing um, the capacity of the home. And so the way that it works, because of course, when you are 3D printing, the printer works like a gantry system and you need the full horizontal plane to actually print. So the way that it works is you can't put a vertical bar that's you know four feet plus because then it's going to be in the it's going to obstruct the actual location of the printing happening on the horizontal plane. So the way that it works is that we pour the foundation like a regular um, you know concrete foundation, and then we have uh, we use coil rods. So it's the exact same thing as a, a regular vertical bar, but it's in segmented um, sections, and then we're, we have a mechanical fastener. So if you could imagine you have your rebar cage in the foundation, and then you have coil rods that are vertically you know, placed, and then they're in segments of let's say one foot. So you have, you print, then you put the coil rods in, and they're mechanically fastened. Then you have another mechanical fastener, and then you print another layer, and then you're able to put in another vertical bar on top and mechanically fasten it in. So it's a different way of actually building up, but it's using all the same materials. The main difference is we're using coil rods instead of regular rebar. So of course that's more expensive to do because now you're starting to use mechanical fasteners and a little bit more labor. Um, but that's actually a very good question in terms of how can we be more innovative and be more efficient with our cost savings um, for future generations of 3D printing. So things like using fibers for adding in um, it, reinforcement is something that's incredibly innovative that we could do. But for the very first scale that we want to do, the very first prototypes, we want to use as traditional methods as we could in terms of actually creating a calculation package that could be, you know, comparable to a U.S. building permit uh, for concrete structures. We have, uh, actually, no, we don't have time for one more, <laughs> but I'm sure, is there any last, like, really urgent, yes, we have one last urgent question. <laughs> I'm just wondering why do venture capitalists give you millions of dollars? <laughs> like, I heard the, venture capitalists. <laughs> what was the question? Why, I'll, I'll try to repeat it because I think our signal is not great. Um, why do venture capitalists give you millions of dollars? So venture capitalists do not give us millions of dollars. We do not go to venture capitalists for funding. We actually use philanthropy. So the way that our funding system works is that we have two programs. Uh, we have one called the Architects Program, one called the Builders Program. The Architects Program is people who want to donate through philanthropy um, to actually building. So they are paying for 100% of the cost of the materials and the home construction, and 100% of that funding goes to building. Our other program called the Builders Program, that's high net individuals who they want to do impact investing with no returns. So they essentially, through philanthropy, want to invest in the company and they want to invest in our mission. And why they're doing that, it's because they see this major housing crisis and they believe in what we're doing and they believe in how we're doing things differently by focusing on R&D. So to answer your question of why, I, um, I could have you think about you know, the impact behind this and think about how it's very important for people to be thinking of where to adopt innovations first for the context of impact. Good, so that's all the time we have today. I will say it's not the last we've heard of New Story because um, they will be one of our partners for the, the, the course project. And so you can sign up um, if you'd like to work on um, specifically the challenge of solving homelessness in one city for five years. And as a group, uh, the, the, your team will work on, um, on trying to answer this challenge and thinking about innovative outside the box solutions that maybe a new story would like to use. So um, they're one of the course partners and um, we'll talk more about that next week when we launch the course project. That's next week, right? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, but then let me just end by uh, once again, thank you Julieta so much for the guest lecture and we really appreciate uh, everything um, that you shared with us. So thank you very much. Of course, thank you.